I, I hope we all agree that improving road traffic safety is an important uh, public health goal. And uh, in the short time that Peter and I have with you today, we'd just like to cover off uh, some of these issues around um, cannabis and driving, particularly uh, epidemiology, attitudes uh, to cannabis and driving, and the types of evidence that are now available, given that uh, the methodologies and uh, the technologies have moved on quite a lot in the last 10 or so years. And finally, of course, just to let you know what Nick Pitt can offer you around smoking and smoking and driving uh, materials. This uh, was the kind of uh, advertising material which uh, um, piqued my interest and uh, and highlighted some of the attitudes in the general community. And this is um, a promotional campaign for a uh, car rental agency where apparently um, the passcode I'm stoned um, is uh, your uh, open gateway to uh, a cheaper booking to uh, renting um, a vehicle from them. And I think that this is kind of quite the opposite of the message that, uh, that we're trying to get across and, and really shows how far we need to, uh, to move the debate along around awareness of uh, the effects of cannabis and driving. Just uh, a little uh, Cannabis 101, just in that it highlights uh, some of the issues um, to do with, uh, with cannabis that, uh, that make its, uh, its use when driving um, less than uh, wise. So smoked cannabis exerts its psychoactive effects within minutes and they peak within around 30 minutes. And as we all know, regular smokers can take um, more than four weeks to have a negative urinalysis for metabolites. What we also know now as the science has moved on, and I'll, I'll mention in a moment, is that heavy users can also um, have THC detected, the actual active drug THC, for more than 30 days. And uh, also when people starve or when they exercise, this also releases THC from fat, so um, levels can go up again. There are at least two endogenous uh, cannabinoid receptor systems and CB1, of course, is the one that concerns us most in our work. And you can see because of the distribution of the CB1 receptors, they're in the parts of, of the brain which affect driving-related skills, executive function, for example, emotional control, motor control and levels of arousal. The other is the um, behavioural effects. And you can see here, these are the kinds of effects um, which are, are clearly not a prescription uh, for safe driving with um, feelings of, of euphoria, impaired co concentration, learning and memory, and in particular, um, panic or, or paranoia reactions are not the kinds of uh, um, you know, drag on skills that uh, are, are suitable for, for driving. It's very similar, of course, to alcohol. Um, I'm going to run through now the, uh, the latest information around detection windows in the various um, testing matrices. But, uh, you know, just to make the point, in general, detection does not um, necessarily imply impairment, although with blood, of course, um, this is the exception. You can see here from the scale and where I learned how to do this, just for these uh, slides, so I'm very proud of my red rings. Um, and that shows you there that um, the levels of, uh, of THC um, are detected for about five hours and it's metabolite for um, 36 hours in blood typically. Um, cannabis or THC is primarily metabolized to 11-hydroxy-THC, which is equipotent, so it is a, um, a metabolite that's psychoactive, and then it's metabolized to 11 or 9 carboxy THC. Um, and this is this one, and we tend to just call it carboxy THC. Uh, in a, a more recent study, um, they found, as I mentioned before, in, with a group of people who were locked in a lab, so we know that they had no further access to, um, to THC products. Um, someone was still testing positive for THC um, after 33 days and uh, finally they had to let them go um, even though they were still testing positive for THC after they dosed them 33 days previously. And interestingly, it was this um, level of THC was still correlated with cognitive deficits that are relevant to driving. So it's not as if it's um, just purely an academic exercise. 
Urine, of course, is uh, the most common um, metrics tested in uh, clinical settings. And the thing that we also know very clearly is that um, levels of metabolite in urine are not a reliable measure of impairment, only of use. Um, and here we have uh, the maximal detection time is out to um, 95 days. So clearly, um, we can detect for a very long time when a regular heavy smoker um, <clears throat> has been smoking even in the last uh, three months. Now, saliva is, um, or oral fluid as it's more correctly termed, is um, what is now used in roadside drug testing. So um, I'm just giving you a couple of examples here. I'm afraid the, uh, the graphs there aren't very clear, so we won't worry about that. Just the take home message. Laboratory studies using the best uh, quality technical measure, um, which is using oral ease shows that at uh, very low detection rates of THC and CBD of about um, one nanogram per litre, the last detection time was about two and a half hours. So that's using the best laboratory method methods of detecting THC and CBD in oral fluid. What we use um, more commonly, of course, in um, Australian roadside testing is an initial drug wipe test followed by a COSART DDS test. So um, this uh, recent study in the US used um, a slightly different version, drug wipe 5S, showed when they'd given uh, the participants uh, cannabis to smoke, um, 300 nanograms per kilogram and then 150 nanograms per kilogram 75 minutes apart using a vaporizer <coughs> with 15 nanograms per litre as the cutoff, they were only able to detect half of the true positives at an hour and a half. So um, the drug wipes do give a high false negative rate and they have a lower detection window. You should be able to detect it ideally. What you'd be looking for is two to four hours as we see with the oral ease. But with the drug wipes, um, there's quite a high false negative rate. Uh, for those of you who are interested in the treatment side of things, we recently ran um, a successful trial of Sativex um, for the management of cannabis withdrawal. Sativex is pretty much half and half THC CBD in an oral spray and it is um, registered for use in Australia for multiple sclerosis and um, you know, we hope that uh, with future work it may be available for cannabis withdrawal. One of the drawbacks, of course, we, and we needed to know, is whether or not it could be detected in oral fluid given it's a mouth spray. And we found that using the Australian roadside testing regime of drug wipe and COSART, um, that it was detectable in oral fluids two hours after use. So that will be a difficulty for people on Sativex regimes. And um, that study has, has just been published if anyone is interested in having a look at that. And finally, the, uh, the, the matrix that we're most familiar with for roadside alcohol testing is breath testing. And this is uh, coming along in the uh, cannabis space. This uh, fairly recent work, almost all of this comes out of laboratories run by Marilyn Hustis. And here she and her colleagues gave participants um, who were occasional and regular users because they like to know what difference it makes, um, how heavy the, the cannabis smoker uses, um, how that affects the testing. Uh, and they were given a 6.8% THC joint, which is about 54 milligrams of THC, and they had 10 minutes to smoke it. And all regular users and almost all occasional users, over 90%, tested positive to around the 54 minutes. So that shows in this earlier work that it may be suitable um, because it's, it's stable at usual temperatures of testing situations and things like that. But the detection window is, um, is shorter as you would anticipate um, with, uh, with breath testing of around uh, half an hour to two hours. But um, it's certainly showing that it's likely to um, be something that will be further um, developed and used um, in this space. So that was a quick tour of um, testing regimes.
So now, well, what is the point? Is is cannabis to use such an issue that we need to be concerned? And hopefully you're all pretty much aware of these data, but just to quickly mention that, um, of course, cannabis is by far the most commonly used illicit drug. And after a, a good period of uh, significant reduction, unfortunately, for reasons I won't speculate on here, we're on the upswing in terms of cannabis use. Similarly, um, we have here the um, age um, demographic breakdown for males. Um, so the rates of males and females are converging, but it's uh, still higher amongst males. So the groups that we would be most concerned about, of course, are our adolescent, our very new drivers, um, but, uh, but also the 20 to 29 year olds who are most commonly um, using cannabis and therefore one would imagine being caught driving with cannabis. But interestingly, it's our 40 to 49s who we know from other data are most likely to be are the age group with the highest rates of dependence. And of course, if you're smoking every day, you're more likely to be driving when you're smoking. And our dear 50, 50, to, 50 to 59 year olds, um, they've rediscovered cannabis, bless them, and um, there are fastest growing rates. Amongst our high um, risk groups are uh, those involved in the criminal justice setting who may um, suffering various degrees of marginalisation with socioeconomic deprivation, etc., and also um, tend to be risk takers. And this is um, data from Juma, where um, high levels of detection over 50%, um, and particularly amongst the young males, uh, 61%. So it highlights for any of, of you who work in criminal justice settings or related settings, that uh, talking about the issue of cannabis and cannabis and driving as part of that um, is, is an important aspect to your work. Attitudes um, are also very important and um, we can see here that uh, the majority of the general public do understand, they believe that um, their cannabis use would increase the risk of an accident. Unfortunately, they're probably also the sensible ones who would never consider doing it. Um, it's the, the younger people that uh, we need to be most concerned about. So this is an example from um, Adam Winstock's uh, global survey of, um, of young sort of club drug users um, typically, found that um, a third of them thought that the police, only a third thought that the police could probably or definitely tell that they were stoned within two hours of driving. And this is really um, the, the nub of it because we really need people to have a strong perception of the likelihood of detection in order for um, drug, roadside drug testing, for example, to be a deterrent as we see with um, roadside alcohol testing. And uh, pre-licensed drivers is a very polite New Zealand term, I think, for unlicensed drivers. So they're um, young people that are caught without a license. Um, committing some sort of driving offence and they're also um, cannabis smokers and it's this very group with very who are young with uh, very poor driving skills who are using cannabis um, who are most likely um, to be caught and they're a group of course that we really need to be very concerned about. Um, I don't have time to talk about this particular Dutch study, but uh, as you can see from the cartoon on this and the previous slide, there's a very strong mythology that not only is um, does cannabis uh, make you a safe driver, in fact, it makes you a better driver. And oops, not sure what happened there. Um, and so I'll just direct you, for those of you who are interested, um, to see the kind of mythology that's there on the um, the lower right of your screen is one of the um, stoner websites that has um, the links to these these studies, which are typically at least 20 years old. Um, they're not usually published in a peer-reviewed literature, and this particular Dutch one is one that's very widely cited when you um, have discussions with people who very have very firm beliefs that uh, that cannabis um, is not a risk for driving. So if you have to work with these groups, then um, have a look at some of these studies and have a bit of a critique so uh, you can be aware of the kinds of problems with those studies um, that are glossed over by um, these groups. So I'll hand over now to Peter who can take us through um, the evidence around uh, the different kinds of testing procedures for cannabis and driving. Thanks, Peter. Okay, thank you, Jan. Hello, everyone. 
So I'm just going to begin by putting things into a, a bit of context. I'm sure everyone's aware of the dangers of drink driving. And of course, we have established uh, measures of impairment limits with a 0.05% blood alcohol level. But unfortunately, with cannabis, we don't have such a thing. And there is a bit of a confusion in the community. As Jan uh, alluded to, one in 10 individuals in the community don't find any risk of accident following cannabis use, or they don't believe in it. Um, but what I'm going to do is start by looking at the prevalence of drink driving and cannabis driving, and then I'll move into the research that we have available on the impairments that cannabis smoking has on driving. So in Australia, we have the National Drug Strategy Household Survey. Um, and from that, we get information about drug driving. Um, but unfortunately, it doesn't specify cannabis. Um, but we get that figure there of 2.2% having ever reported driven a vehicle after the influence of an illicit drug. Um, and comparable um, percentages from the US would be around 4.2%. And we can see there that it's um, reduced significantly since the previous survey in 2007 by about 0.7%. But when we're looking at information that's specific to cannabis, we usually rely on such things as roadside surveys and information from the police and drug um, trafficking. Uh, sorry, let me get this slide going. OK, so um, looking at such roadside surveys, um, this information has come from the European Monitoring Centre for Drugs and Drug Addiction. And they looked at surveys between 1997 and 2007 from multiple countries. And we get uh, the figures there, 0.3% to 7.4%, an average of 3.9% of drivers testing positive for cannabis. So that's from blood, urine and saliva testing, roadside tests. And Australia contributed the lowest rate there at 0.3%. Um, for some Australia-specific information, there's been a very recent study published by Davies Group um, that's just literally out. Um, and it was looking at uh, roadside testing um, specific to Queensland um, from 2007 to 2012. And they looked over 80,000 drivers. And we are talking about drivers in this study in that um, they're driving cars rather than truckies. Um, so 82.9% eight, of um, the um, data from this survey were for car drivers. And across that period from 2007 to 2012, they found a drug detection rate of about 2 to 4% of drivers. And um, of those that were detected um, with a drug in their system, we found that 29.8% um, had THC. 22.5% uh, had a combination of THC and methamphetamine, but the most commonly detected drug was methamphetamine at 40.8%. Um, now, there's an important point to make here that demographics matter. Um, so specifically for cannabis, detection rates increased in the younger age groups, the 17 to 24 years, um, males compared to females, and those in the north coast and northern regions. So in comparison with methamphetamine, um, you're looking more at males that uh, were 30 to 39 years, and detection rates increase on the weekends. So for kind of specifically across that time from 2007 to 2012, we saw a bit of a um, change in uh, detection rates. So 29.8% was the average. It began at 5.6% in 2007 when the detection just um, started uh, to go live, increased to 50.8% in 2009, but then decreased again um, to the most recent figure in 2012 at 21.8%. So we see um, just from that last point in the slide that the demographics matter in terms of detection rates. And I've just got here in the first part of the slide a list of a few studies that show how um, detection rates can increase. You see here from like 15 to 60%, depending on who it is that you're sampling. So we've got the higher rates there of um, people that were ravers um, from Britain and nightclub <laughs> patrons. Um, and lower detection rates in older drivers. And um, the second point in the slide there um, is focusing on the rate of um, uh, drug driving following cannabis use reported by cannabis users. So um, this comes from a, a review by Shane Dark in um, 2004. And you can see there that 43.1% to 82% a range across studies ever reported driving under the influence of cannabis. 23% in the last 12 months, and 21% um, in the last week. So um, that's probably enough on the prevalence of cannabis and driving. I'd like to move now into the 
a, a summary of the literature that's available on the impact that cannabis has on driving and driving performance. So the, the, the literature here comes from three um, areas. We have laboratory studies where we've um, got people looking at different areas of cognition in the brain that would um, you would assume affect cannabis and driving. So for example, um, looking at things like your reaction time and tracking ability and therefore estimating that would affect your driving. And um, uh, second area on driving simulator studies. And I say there that there's been some recent support as being valid. Um, the one concern that um, some researchers have with driving simulator studies is the problem of simulator sickness. Um, with the cannabis, it's not so much a problem that's come up. But um, one thing to point out is that you shouldn't rely on the driving simulator studies as a sole test. Um, and perhaps more importantly, we've got the field studies, the last area that I'll cover, um, where we're looking at how much cannabis is responsible for motor vehicle accidents in the real world. So this comes from information that's involved police accent, action, um, where there's been an injury or a fatality in a motor vehicle accident. But I'll start with the lab work, the laboratory research. So listed there, the most consistently found impairments um, across the number of studies that you would assume affect driving. Um, so these are impairments that follow from cannabis use. Um, and uh, I'll let you read through those. And the results um, suggest that there is a dose response relationship here. Um, some further work from Professor Romeka in 2004 shown us that the impairments last typically between two to four hours at their peak and um, can last up to a day. But um, we say their impairment lasts for four plus hours. Okay, so in addition to dose, um, it's important to note that there's an uh, additive effect with drinking and smoking and driving, and also that frequency of use matters. So um, they make more driving errors for regular to, compared to occasional use. Um, you may recall that about one in 10 people don't find a problem with cannabis and driving, and they might, um, might argue that they might drive slower and more attentive when they're driving. And I just got a last point there. Um, that the research that's available doesn't really back this and that we find that um, cannabis users can't reliably tell how long that they're stoned. And more importantly, we find that they um, over-attend to intrapersonal cues, so they, they become too self-aware to the detriment of things around them. Um, so to the driving simulator studies, again, we've got information here from multiple review articles and I've just listed the most consistently found impairments from driving simulator studies. Um, and we find uh, here a lot of issues um, to do with steering and car following. So the car in front of you slows down, you're most likely to slow down along with them. And also lane positioning, keeping in the same lane, following a straight line. Um, so I just mentioned briefly just then about how um, the reduction in average speed of drivers and that they might drive slower. But again, that the research doesn't find that um, they drive more safely and that the impairments are still present. And again, as with lab work, we found that the impairments are dose dependent. So in the field studies, to finish up, um, we've got here, excuse me, um, again, a number of uh, review articles. And um, we're looking at here accidents um, that involve police intervention. So it's primarily blood work and um, from the 14 studies that were available between 1993 and 2005, we found that of those who were injured in an accident, 3.3 to 26.9% um, had cannabis in their system and an average of 11.8%. The Australian results there specifically were 7.1 and 15.2%, so injured in the accident. Then we have 23 studies um, that were following accidents where the driver was killed it was by McDonald in 2003. And the rates here you see um, ranging uh, between 1.4 to 37%, an average of 11.7%. Again, the Australian figures there are of 11 to 13.5%. So just some important points to make from these field studies. Um, I mentioned we don't have uh, the blood alcohol level well established, but there was a study by Groton Herman where he reviewed field studies and came up with a concentration that was between 7 to 10 nanograms per milliliter that was a comparable risk of accident to the blood alcohol level. Um, he said an average of around 5 nanograms per milligram, um, milliliter. 
Um, probably the take home point from these studies uh, was given to us succinctly by Asbridge and colleagues where they um, showed that you were twice as likely to be involved in a collision if you had cannabis in your system. And um, that was from a fatal collision. And that comes from observational studies and case control studies. And the final point there um, is on the standardized mortality rate, where we found in a separate study that you were also 2.3 times more likely to die in an accident. Um, and that's compared to age and gender and race matched individuals. To put that into some kind of perspective, that rate would be 4.5 for alcohol, 3.8 cocaine, 2.8 for opioids, 2.6 for meth. Um, and it changed um, between the males. The males were 2.8 times more likely to die and the females 1.2, but the overall figure there, 2.3. I'll hand you back to Jan. Thank you, Peter. We're done with uh, the technical side now, you'll be pleased to know. And uh, we shuffle chairs. Um, I just wanted to um, show you the resources and things that we have available for you um, uh, at NICPIC. But the, before I make that point, I just wanted to mention that an aspect of um, prevention of negative uh, cannabis-related driving outcomes also needs to focus on recidivist um, cannabis-using drivers who tend to be the most heavily involved with, uh, with cannabis and often also cannabis-dependent, of course. And uh, just showing you here, for example, the UK um, relevant driving legislation where it's not just intoxication but ongoing use, which is an issue for them. And cannabis dependence is actually a reportable condition to um, the driving authorities. And it leads to six months revocation of license. And typically there's a urine and or blood test regime prior to restoration. A survey in that country found that only 14% of addiction psychiatrists who typically are put in charge of, of these caseloads were aware of this requirement. So I wanted to highlight that it is actually a duty to discuss driving risks during assessment. This is particularly for medical practitioners or anyone involved in assessing impairment uh, for driving. And um, th there are similar Australian laws. Um, so I suggest if you're working in that area that you um, that you check uh, with your local driving authorities what the uh, requirements are in your state. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, um, we've demonstrated that whilst there's some problems with studies, inconsistent methods and results, there's nonetheless um, a clear association between cannabis use and impairment and risk of a motor vehicle accident, um, particularly fatal motor vehicle accident. We need uh, further research to establish that um, 7 to 10 or something even 2 to 5 nanogram per mil um, limit for THC uh, amongst drivers. Um, we're lucky in some ways here in Australia, I'm sure some would disagree, but uh, and the fact that cannabis is illegal means that we don't have to demonstrate a level of impairment, just its presence. And uh, interestingly, the role of brief interventions, harm reduction interventions to reduce cannabis uh, driving behaviours was demonstrated by Bernard Fisher in his study with college students, where the aim really was just harm reduction. Um, it was a message that committed cannabis users were prepared to take on. So it's one that we should uh, um, begin with, if you like, in, in developing the relationship because it is an acceptable message even to committed uh, smokers. Finally, uh, just uh, to direct you to our website and our um, materials, our new cannabis and driving fast facts, which is a handy um, little brochure, and our new website with the uh, smoke and drive. We have these uh, range of promotional materials. We did send out 162,000 Avant cards with this message about uh, um, stone driver on board and we still have those kinds of materials available. Not all of them at this time but uh, over time we will. We also had a meme which uh, took a little while to uh, work through the system and wasn't quite as quirky as we hoped in the end but uh, nonetheless it's, um, it's quite cute and it's on our Facebook uh, page and uh, so please feel free to share it amongst um, your colleagues. Now um, I'll Apologies to Tracy, but we'll just show you a couple of very short um, 
video, so if you'd like to show the first one, please. Uh, I don't mind if I take it slowly, I'm just, just uh, awareness kind of a candid I'm just camera a bit baked right now, quite frankly. Oh, I'm just going to um, let this buzz just wear off. And, uh, Are you feeling sick? No, no, quite the opposite. Don't you worry. Quite the opposite. Uh, alrighty. I've just just been around at my mate's place this morning. Just finished off some weed just before we, we came round, so I'm in a good headspace, so don't you worry. Oh, well, um, I don't know if that's very good. Neither of you got any food on you, any chance, do you? Got the munchies, bro. <laughs> do you know where you're going? I think you might need calling. to go back. It's a good ride. Might be best if you pull over. I think I might just get out. You want me to pull over? Yeah, I don't think this is very professional. Oh, OK, well, hold on. Um, no, not good at all. 32% of those surveyed said it's safe to drive high. Thanks. Do you have a problem with that? Uh, this is the second one. Um, yeah, this is the second one from our cannabis and driving um, materials. They're also um, available through our website. Um, probably won't show that now because we're running into Tracy's time. But um, uh, please check both of those out. As you can see, they're both on YouTube and they're good little training materials as well to get people thinking about uh, cannabis and driving. So finally, um, I'm not sure we have time for questions here, but please um, do email us any questions. If they're of the highly technical variety, we will, if we can't answer them ourselves, we will certainly um, help put you in touch um, with the most appropriate people. So thank you for your attention and um, I look forward to uh, the next time we do a webinar. Thank you very much.